want to thank everyone for joining us. Whether you're here on the East Coast or on the West Coast or anywhere in between, really anywhere around the world, thank you for what's an incredibly important conversation, really an urgent conversation for this fight to from home. Um, I think all of us right now are trying to sort of find our place and still feel unmoored after the barbarity that took place in 10-7 and then the ensuing difficulties we've seen here in America in the seven months, the 206 days since that tragic event. What we're seeing now across the country is truly horrendous. Over the last two weeks, I personally have spent time on college campuses. And again, I've talked to many professors, I've talked to college presidents, I've talked to members of Congress, but for me, as the dad of two kids, a college sophomore and a college freshman. I've never seen a moment like this before. And I'm just appalled. I've talked to students at places like Columbia, Harvard, USC, UCLA, and beyond the last two weeks, in the last four to six, at places like Wake Forest, ASU, Miami, Brown, and many others. And again, it is not alarming. We are well past the alarmed phase. It is appalling and really heartbreaking. To see, and again, I have seen this myself, students crying, yelling, shaking with exhaustion and fear and frustration and, you know, rage as they share their stories of intimidation and harassment and the failure of administrations to help. Parents keeping their students home from college because they are afraid for their safety. Kids moving out of dorms, because again, they are afraid for their safety. Leaving school early to do classes remotely, because they are afraid for their safety. Administrators totally losing control over community spaces. I think all of us are glued to our televisions, watching these scenes unfold right now in real time. There's in the television over here, there are pictures of what's happening at Fordham University and law enforcement, law enforcement being called in to police against violence and protect our children because campus police, or as they're sometimes known, public safety officers seem incapable or unable to do their jobs. And seeing it firsthand, again, I would tell you, it is worse than you get out of watching these clips. Uh, you know, I, when I talk to students at Harvard Law School, they talk about the harassment that they face on a daily basis, coordinated campaigns to isolate them by other Harvard Law School students. When I was at Columbia speaking to Jewish kids, I heard their agony and pain as they've been abandoned by their friends, their quote unquote, so-called friends. And then I heard the same stories just last Friday when I was at USC or at UCLA this past Sunday, three, four days ago, I was there on the ground, in the crowd, and I saw the pushing, I saw the shoving, I found myself caught between protesters. And just so we're clear, I would describe the Jewish community as protesting what was going on. I would describe the other side as activists uh, who were using physical force to move the Jewish folks or to prevent the Jewish people from passing on public space, right? And I saw the encampment and how at UCLA, the students had taken over buildings entirely. And let's talk for a about who are these groups that are taking over the buildings and driving these encampments. And that's important. These are not organic ceasefire rallies. These are not sudden um, swells of grassroots energy. These are being organized and coordinated by a handful of groups, including Palestinian Youth Movement. That is an org, PYM, that in response to a very generous offer from Colombia President Shafiq a few days ago, I think that was on Monday, PYM on their official Instagram account posted a picture written on her letter that wrote, Colombia will burn. Okay, these are students. Uh, PYM openly glorifies terrorists, including one who hijacked two airplanes and another who killed college students in a terror attack at Hebrew University years ago. 
PYM also celebrated Iran's missile and drone attack on Israel two weeks ago. Students for Justice in Palestine is another organization, or SJP. They're a key national player, probably the single largest driver of all this. They have a long history of applauding or justifying terror attacks in Israel. They don't refer to, by the way, the Jewish state as Israel. In their materials, it's called, quote, the Zionist entity. They declared, following 10-7, it was a, quote, historic win for Palestinian resistance, end quote. And SJP called for, quote, not just slogans and rallies, but armed confrontation with the oppressors, end quote. And when these organizations trumpet the idea that Jewish groups are joining them in the planning or execution, let's talk about the main organization, an outfit called Jewish Voices for Peace. This is a group that is on the furthest fringe of our community. Their leadership declared multiple times in the aftermath of 10-7 and the slaughter and the torture and the horror of that day that Israel was the, quote, root cause of the violence. I mean, it's profane. It's profane. And that's who's organizing these rallies, groups like PYM and SJP and JVP. That does not mean that every kid who's in an encampment shares those views. I'm not saying that. That doesn't mean that every protester wants to destroy Israel. I'm not saying that either. And we need to have compassion and open hearts when we see the death of innocent Palestinian civilians in Gaza, let's be clear about that. Our, the, the Torah teaches us, the Talmud teaches us that any innocent killed, any innocent killed, it's the loss of an entire world. So we can have deep compassion for the Palestinian civilians, even while we remember not just the you know, 133 hostages still being held under Gaza, although again, we will never forget them. Not just the 1,200 civilians and thousands who were wounded on 10-7, uh, but the entire Jewish people have been endangered and imperiled by this global surge of anti-Semitism that was sparked on 10-7, caused by Hamas. And again, Hamas can end this whenever they choose by releasing the hostages, by laying down their arms and declaring that they're willing to live side by side with the Jewish state. And until that happens, Hamas, Hamas, Hamas puts us in this terrible position of conflict and war. Now, I also just want to say, uh, not all of this, again, is just anti-Jewish. And not everyone who's involved in this is anti-Jewish. But those main organizers, they are not, ju not just anti-Jewish. They are anti-American. JVP retweeted posts with signs that said, curse the Jews, next to signs that said, death to America. I heard the chants myself, like long live Hamas when I was at UCLA. And I saw, I've seen the pictures, and I saw firsthand uh, when I was at UCLA of them ruining American flags. I actually did a video when I was at UCLA where I put an American flag around my shoulder. Some of you may have seen it on Instagram. That, what you don't know is that that American flag I picked up off the ground after one of these activists was stepping on the flag and walking on it with her feet to rub it into the ground. It was despicable. And I took it from her and I put it on my shoulders uh, because I'm proud to wear the American flag because I am awfully proud to be an American. But it is appalling. It is appalling, the behavior. And so many of these students are actually like the woman who had previously been stepping on the flag, her face concealed in a, in a full face mask. I mean, just like white supremacists historically have used, you know, means to hide their identities. The KKK wore white hoods. The Proud Boys often will wear bak bak baklavas. I think they're called baklavas. You eat baklavas. They wear these full face ski masks. Um, we see Oath Keepers too will often wear masks. We see the SJP and the PYM activists wearing masks at these events. And don't take my word for it, although I've seen it up close and you can see the pictures on my Instagram feed. You can see the pictures every day that are being shown on the news of the individuals in these, in these uh, protests. It's completely unacceptable. I don't think any university should permit full face masking on their campus, especially when it's done in service of intimidating and terrorizing and tormenting other people. Again, I'm not talking about a COVID-style K95, not talking about that. 
I mean, that, I understand that. And there may be religious reasons to wear certain garb. I'm not talking about that as well. But when you conceal your identity, just try to disguise yourself for, for the purpose of harassing your classmates, I don't think that should be allowed. I don't think that's a free speech issue at all. I think it's a public safety imperative. So we need to get that squared away. And it has nothing to do with the First Amendment. It doesn't say, it says freedom of speech and freedom of religion in the First Amendment. It doesn't say freedom to hide behind a mask. So again, you can terrorize other people. That's what I believe. And I also believe that anyone who is interfering with classes, anyone who is harassing or threatening their peers, anyone who is uh, vandalizing school property, breaking into buildings, should be subject to campus discipline and or face legal consequences. And again, we're all watching the videos that are taking place right now. It is painful to see what appear to be examples of maybe some law enforcement using excessive force to remove individuals from uh, these scenes. However, it is not normal, again, when students, or we don't know, some of these people are likely not students because they're concealing their identities. We don't know who they are. But when they are physically intimidating and assaulting their classmates, vandalizing school property at Columbia, they held three janitors against their will in that building uh, on Monday night. Like that is entirely unacceptable. Um, and so again, when protests are interfering with classes, harassing, assaulting other students, the school must enforce time, place, and manner rules, as well as ensure they're not make, offering concessions to these people. They should be disciplining them with consequences. I don't think it's that hard. And as UF President Ben Sass said, universities, they're not daycare centers. These individuals, they're over the age of 18. They're not children, they're adults. And we need to treat them as such, okay? And when they are calling for Jews or Zionists or Israelis to be removed from campus, they're expressing support for Hamas. When we're seeing them urge Hamas to commit further violence, when we're seeing them again directly confronting students, it's unacceptable, which is why, and to see this happening all over the country, we're tracking more than 80 encampments at this point, it's a national emergency. We wouldn't tolerate this level of hate directed at any other minority group, and we shouldn't direct, tolerate it when it's directed against Jews. So we've been urging for months that when students violate campus policies, there've got to be consequences. It's time, it's time for all campuses to instill these time, place, and manner restrictions to ensure that these protests, which again are not just anti-Semitic, they're anti-American. They're not just anti-Zionist, they're anti-everyone, um, are no longer permitted. Again, I, I wanna be crystal clear, there's nothing wrong with criticizing the state of Israel. There's nothing wrong with supporting the Palestinian cause. There is something deeply wrong with intimidating, threatening, assaulting your classmates. No way. And we know at ADL, because we track these kinds of incidents, we saw 920, we've seen well over 920 anti-Jewish acts since 10-7 up until, you know, the end of uh, this month, the month of April. That's a more than 400% increase over the same time frame last year. I mean, it's astonishing when you think about the fact that 2022 was the highest year we ever saw. We recently released our campus anti-Semitism report card, assessing how universities were doing to ensure Jewish students were kept safe. We developed this as a tool for students, but also for parents or alumni or college faculty or guidance counselors or admissions consultants, so they better understand what's happening on these campuses. You can go to ADL.org and see it. And at this point now, today being May 1, with commencement exercises starting uh, I think this month and the next week or two, universities have got to act and prevent these anti-Jewish, these anti-American protesters from disturbing and sort of holding hostage this crucial milestone, especially for our young people who missed their high school graduations due to COVID. So we've called on colleges to take clear and decisive action now, which means you coordinate with law enforcement to, and campus security to ensure that your graduation ceremonies or events and related functions run smoothly, to make sure that every student feels safe um, rather than unsafe, welcome rather than uh, hated, 
Second, ensure again, everyone knows there will be clear consequences if you violate the policy. And third, shore up your protocols, shore up your tactics on how you'll mitigate the risk of students interfering with the rights of others. And finally, and most importantly, campus presidents have got to use their voice. They have been far too silent for far too long. And I think that's part of how we got into this mess. In order to keep our community aware, to keep people appraised, today we're launching a new product at ADL. We're calling it the ADL Campus Crisis Daily. It's an alert that we'll be publishing every day to give, again, students and alumni and parents and other interested parties urgent updates about what's happening on U.S. campuses, including actions that you can take, information from our partners, and trying to help you be better informed and better, more effective at helping to stem the tide of hate. So there'll be ways to take action. The first one will go out today, and then they'll be coming out at 9 a.m. every weekday. All right, now I'd like to welcome ADL's Vice President of Advocacy and my colleague, Shira Goodman, on the call. Shira, over to you. Thanks, Jonathan. Actually, we're very lucky. Congressman Richie Torres has joined a few minutes early, so I'm going to ask you to come back and uh, oh. have your conversation with the congressman, and I'll come back a few minutes later. Great. Congressman Torres, are you there? So nice to see you. How are you? Never, never a dull moment, uh, but it's, it's an honor to be here. Never a dull moment. I am really, really grateful that you would take the time to join us, even for a few minutes today. You have been not just an ally of our community. Congressman Torres, you've been a champion, really a hero to so many of us for a long time, but especially the aftermath of 10-7. Can you share a little bit about, you know, your personal experience? What are your personal experiences or your values that drive your commitment on this issue and to our community? Well, to, you know, to the extent that I have any virtues, my mother deserves all the credit. Um, you know, I would attribute whatever empathy that I have as a person uh, to my mother, who's my hero, and, and I would not be here were not for my mother. Um, you, you know, people are often in a state of shock that a Black, gay, Latino member of Congress can care deeply about fighting anti-Semitism. And I reject the notion that one must be Jewish to combat anti-Semitism, just like I would reject the notion that one must be black to combat anti-black racism. You know, throughout history, there have been Jews who gave their lives for the cause of civil rights. 60 years ago, Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, as well as James Cheney, were barbarically murdered so that people who look like me could have the right to vote and live freely, unencumbered by the inhumanity of Jim Crow. Uh, and so I operate under the principle that we're all in this together. Uh, and that we all have a moral obligation to fight hate and extremism, no matter what direction from which it comes. Uh, and the mission of the ADL should be the mission of every person. I so appreciate that. And I, I hope one day I'll have the privilege of meeting your mom or Mrs. Torres. I mean, because she is a saint upon saints. And uh, we all owe her, I think, Mr. Congressman, a debt of gratitude. I really mean that. I appreciate that. Um, Look, you and I have talked before about the staggering rise of anti-Semitism. Last year was far and away the worst year we've ever recorded. There was a 321% increase year over year in acts of harassment and vandalism and violence on campuses. Most happened after 10-7. Of course, Congress has a role to play in stemming the hate. And I know you've led several initiatives and you've, you're co-sponsoring the Countering Anti-Semitism Act. Talk to us about what you think Congress should be doing in response to this avalanche of anti-Semitism and this sort of tsunami of hate. Yeah, and, and you know, I want to express the view that October 7th of the post-October 7th world did not change the state of anti-Semitism on college campuses. It reveals what higher education has become. Uh, there has been a concerted effort to indoctrinate our students with a hatred for Israel that's so visceral and so fanatical that it renders them indifferent to the value of Jewish life. And that's precisely what we, we're seeing on college campuses. Um, as you know, Title VI prohibits discrimination and intimidation based on race, religion, and national origin. Uh, and Jews enjoy the protection of Title VI. So for me, the problem is not a lack of legislation, it's a lack of enforcement. The federal government has been fundamentally ineffective at enforcing Title VI in relation to combating anti-Semitism. 
And, and so I'm proposing that the Federal Department of Education have the authority to impose a monitor. Like I'm skeptical that the DOE can effectively enforce Title VI from the ivory tower of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. There should be a monitor who's on site, who can see the facts on the ground with his own eyes, and who can report whether a particular university or college is complying with the law. And if the university refuses to take corrective action, then, then there should be a loss of federal funds. We should leverage the power of federal funding to combat anti-Semitism in the ranks of higher education. You know, if we do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, yeah. as a wise person once said, that's that's the definition of insanity. It's Look, I think it's super smart in a couple ways, not the least of which is Department of Ed moves so slowly. It's glacial. And they have such a, such a backlog of cases. So putting people on the ground would expedite things. And I think, like you said, sort of elucidate and open people's eyes dramatically. Um, speaking of campuses, you know, we released our report card, our campus report card uh, last month in April. I, I know you saw it and we've had a chance again to discuss it. A lot of schools, 80 plus schools, a number of them got F's and D's, like almost half, which is really astonishing. And I, I really think appalling. I mean, we don't want to grade them on a curve. Our intent is to grade them badly. And yet, when you look at objective measures, that's how they landed. What more do you think all of us can be doing to hold university administrators specifically accountable? And, and what's your thought? I saw, and I, I'm sure you're well aware, Chairwoman Fox has now called to testify the presence of Yale, Michigan, and uh, UCLA, the Chancellor of UCLA uh, later this month. What's your thought on, on that as well? Look, uh, we have to strike while the iron's hot. This is a historic opportunity to confront the deepening rot of anti-Semitism on college campuses. And so I welcome the scrutiny. I welcome the oversight hearings. All of it is long overdue. But ultimately, there is no substitute for policy solutions. And I believe Democrats and Republicans should come together and legislate a solution or a set of solutions to the deepening crisis of anti-Semitism on college campuses. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be careful not to politicize it and recognize that the fight against anti-Semitism is so critical that it should transcend a partisanship. Yeah. You know? and, and that's that's my view. And I wanna commend uh, ADL for issuing a scorecard because that will create a powerful reputational incentive for these institutions to combat anti-Semitism with the same sense of urgency that it combats every other form of discrimination. Thank you for that. I appreciate the, the kind words. I mean, we think so too. That was the idea to encourage a race to the top. And let, let's hope we get there. Um, look, I know your time is limited. Last question, Mr. Congressman. Um, You've got a lot of parents and students who are on the line today who've logged in from campuses or from home because they care about this issue. What message do you want to deliver to them? Never lose hope. Uh, know that you have organizations like ADL that have your back. Know that there are members of Congress like myself who have your back and you should leverage us. We have platforms that can amplify your stories and your voices. And, you know, my message to the next generation of Jewish students is, is to be the Maccabees of the modern world. Um, you know, if, if, if you censor yourself, if, if you are in the closet about your Zionism and your Jewish identity, then you become the part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Uh, and so I would just tell people to stand up to the intimidation, to stand up to the harassment and to be proud of their Judaism, to be proud of their Zionism. Because where there's fear, there can never be freedom, and we should choose freedom. I love that so much. So then let me ask you one last, I'll, I'll remember what I said, ask you one last question. As a, as a gay man who came out when you were a young person, I'm sure it was difficult to come to terms with your identity. And I do hear from young Jewish people today that they feel like they are going in the closet and hiding their own identities. Like, that's a tough personal struggle. And it took courage from you to do that for yourself. Where do you, how do you muster that courage if you're 18 years old or 19 years old and your friends are abandoning you and, you know, you find yourselves coming under this kind of pressure, Congressman? Well, you do need a, you do need a supportive community that can give you the strength you need to embrace who you are. But, but I, I do see an analogy. I mean, you know, historically our society said to LGBTQ people that, that you have to be in the closet. You have to be ashamed of who you are. 
And that's the same kind of message that the progressive movement, unfortunately, is sending to young Jews, that in order to be part of our club, you have to be in the closet about your Zionism. You have to be ashamed of your Zionism. And, and that, to me, is not progressivism. That's a perversion of progressivism. I cannot imagine anything more evil than to tell people you have to renounce your own sense of identity and, and, and history. Uh, and, and I think we should refuse to do that. Here, here. Do you have any other thoughts as to why this is happening now? Like this perversion, I mean, look, I, um, I worked for President Obama and proudly did so. Uh, I never would have thought we'd be here. What, what do you think happened along the way? Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, anti-Semitism has been brewing for a long time uh, and it's reaching a boiling point. Uh, and the crisis has become too glaring to ignore. But I see both social media and call it and academia as the two disproportionate drivers of of the anti-Zionist form of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. You know, these ideas like decolonization and intersectionality and settler colonial theory have been percolating in academia for a long time, but it's social media that enables those ideas to permeate outward into the broader society. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's the convergence of those two forces uh, that have led to anti-Semitism to an extent that we have not seen in recent history. Mm -hmm. Here you are. Tough stuff. Well, look, Mr. Congress, I know you've got to get back to, to your day job. We so appreciate you. We appreciate your courage and your fortitude and really your friendship. So thank you for being here for us and know that we're here for you too. Thank Absolutely. You. Take care. All right. Um, I think we're going to hand it over to Shira if Shira is still with us. Hi, hey, Jonathan. Thank you. That was terrific. She, he's uh, uh, love now to welcome Barry Seitz, a first year student at the University of Texas, Austin, uh, and Francine Ephraim, a parent uh, with college students, including one at Tufts, to join me for a conversation about what they're doing, what they're seeing, and what you can do. So, Barry, you're a first year at UT Austin. You also are the vice president of Longhorn Students for Israel. What's been going on right now? What are you and your organization doing? Yes, thank you so much for having me today. So the past week or so, we've definitely seen an uptick in violent protests here in Austin on campus. Um, these protests were initially staged, um, and I quote from the PSC, to stand with their comrades at Columbia. Um, and since then, they've been geared more towards um, fighting the arrest that took place at the first um, at the first protest. And what my organization has been doing is we have not been counter protesting these protests. It is not our intention to engage with the protesters to um, spark any more mm -hmm. violent sentiment. But what we do want to do is show that there are attempts to occupy, to so-called liberate, and even reclaim our university are never going to work, and that no matter what they do, there is going to be a Jewish, Zionist, and Israeli presence on our um, campus. Thanks, Barry. Francine, is what Barry um, is saying familiar to you from your own students, uh, especially at Tufts? Yes, thank you, Shira, for inviting me. And thank you, Barry. Uh, your leadership is commendable. Uh, yes, we're hearing, you know, the students are not directly counter protesting uh, in person. They are using social media to get out messages that are very targeted, uh, like Barry said, um, uh, calling out lies, explaining, you know, trying to trying to get the truth out trying to get that message out. And they're also gathering in safe spaces at Hillel and Chabad on campus to um, be able to gather, express their identity and, and pull together. Um, Barry, you didn't really get to this, uh, but many students are not able to ignore it. I don't know if you're able to or not able to personally um, ignore it, but some students are not, and it really depends on whether they are a person who outwardly expresses their Jewish identity or whether they're, they are one to kind of just go, you know, be able to meld into the scene. Obviously, those who are Orthodox, who wear a kippah, uh, who dress differently, have a harder time, but also just even the simple act of wearing a Jewish star, you know, is a 
bold and brave act. So some students are better able to ignore it than others. And that is also a personality thing. No, um, I can absolutely agree. I think what's most all like something that's so awful about these protests is it's impossible to ignore because they're taking over our campuses. Like at, we are at UT right now, we are in the middle of the finals week. And I have myself included so many of my friends, like we've not been able to walk to the library to go study for our finals or write our final papers because these attempts at encampments are taking over campus. Like it's not a protest at that point, it's deterring from our education. Um, and Francine, then again, oh, continue. Sorry, go ahead, Barry. Um, as Francine was saying, like, it's impossible to ignore them when you're walking by with an Israeli flag or a Jewish star. Like some protesters are going to heckle you and are going to start calling you all sorts of ugly terms. And it is impossible to ignore in a variety of ways. Francine, I know and you're I'll, really I'll, concerned yeah. about graduation. You have a senior. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about uh, the work that you led with other parents uh, to your university? Specific to graduation or in general? Specific to graduation, but if there's been a, a history leading up to that, that most recent advocacy, please share it. Yeah, so following October 7th, uh, the parent and alumni community at Tufts organized. Um, our first attempt was to write a letter to the administration trying to get them to shut, examine and shut down SJP and adopt the IRA definition. Um, that didn't really go so far, but uh, we did... Uh, Start a social media account, a Facebook account for parents and alumni. It has now expanded well beyond Tufts Parents and Alumni, Tufts uh, Jewish Alliance, more than 800 members. And there are lots of letter writing and calling campaigns happening um, over time. It just kind of depends on the moment and what we're responding to. Uh, I will also add, this is very important for those who want to establish uh, a presence, a parent presence or an alumni presence on campus. We've established dialogues with many other uh, organizations, both on campus and off campus, which have been instrumental. And I think it's really key to get a sense of what's going on on campus. We as parents are not on campus. We do not know what is best. We do not know the best way to respond. We have uh, worked with organizations like Barry's uh, at Tufts, it's called Tufts Friends of Israel. We have worked and talked to those leaders to find out what's going on because they're having conversations with administrators that we didn't know about until we had that conversation. And we've also worked with ADL Northeast, Stand With Us, uh, alumni, Alums for Campus Fairness, the list goes on and on, Brandeis Law Center, et cetera. Uh, so that dialogue is really important so that parents and alumni are not working in a vacuum. Uh, to answer your question about commencement, uh, about maybe three weeks ago, it was close to the time the University of Michigan commencement honors ceremony was, I mean, not commencement, but honors ceremony was disrupted. It was just before that, actually. We mobilized and drafted a letter specific to our concerns about graduation, even before all these encampments uh, started. We were concerned that protests would happen and that commencement would be uh, disrupted. So we wrote a letter um, and asked all senior parents and family members to co-sign it, and we sent it to administration. Um, we just received a letter back last week that was acknowledging our concerns, uh, though we still have questions. So we're still working on that effort to get further details and as we speak right now, there's a big encampment, and if they don't get it off campus, we don't even know if commencement will proceed. So TBD Thanks. on that. Thanks, Francine. I just want to add, before I go back to Barry, to pick up on something you said, um, we have uh, some resources on our own hub that we created for parents and students and alumni, no tolerance for antisemitism.adl.org. It has sample graduation and commencement policies. It has sample... Uh, I sample uh, demands uh, that parents can use, template letters, so people who are looking for ways to activate can do that. And we'll also, uh, mm -hmm. a little bit later, give you an activation that you can do right today to, to write to any of the colleges that you're connected with. But Barry, Francine raises a great point. Um, you are on the ground, the students are on the ground, your friends uh, across the country are on the ground. What do you need uh, parents and alumni and others to know, and what do you need us to do? 
All right, thank you. So I kind of see that in terms of stuff that we can do right now and things to look forward to in the long term. Right now, just it sounds so silly, but just reaching out to any and every Jewish student you know. I've had so many of my friends or of my friends' parents, of my parents, some of like their like work friends, people that have just seen me on social media, just reach out. We, we see what you're doing. We see how hard this is for you. We're here for you. We love you. And just these little messages, like sometimes it can really feel across any camp. Um, college campus that the university admin or the local governments are not hearing the demands and the pleas of Jewish students and what they need. And it's so nice just to hear that there are people out there who are seeing what's happening on our campuses and seeing that this is not an easy time to be any sort of Jewish student on campus. In the long term, I know that as part of Longhorn Student for Israel, we're really looking to find speakers and bring them to our campus on um, to more in the fall semester. And we're looking for speakers that aren't necessarily going to cater towards the Jewish students and the Israeli students, but more um, speakers that are going to engage towards the middle ground of the students, the students who aren't building the encampment, but the ones who are stopping by and saying, what's going on? I see a small group of Israeli flags over here. I see a large encampment. I see police. So we really want to find and engage in these types of speakers who can really connect to what I hope is a larger population of students than just our Jewish and Israeli students on campus. Great. Um, and what are you hoping, Barry, that the, your university will do over the summer? to ensure that when you come back in the fall, things are different? I think the first step is to hold the students and faculty and organizations accountable for their violent actions on campus. Right now at UT, the PSC has been suspended, but they are still showing up day and day again to protest and have these violent encampments on our campus. So we need to hold these organizations and all of their students involved. We also need to hold the faculty involved. I have had professors at this university tell me, call me a coward, tell me to go back to Poland, and then tell me that they do not engage with Zionists. That is not acceptable. That is not free speech. That's violent. That's hate. And our university needs to hold everyone who is saying and acting in these manners accountable before we can return to campus. Thanks, Barry. I think this is a great time to talk about our activation. Um, if you text campus, the word campus, to 26769, that will take you to an activation. You can find a drop down menu for at least the 85 report card colleges. And if there's this college or university you wanna contact that's not on that list, there's another uh, drop down option so we can get you to the right place that will talk about, in fact, enforcing rules, holding folks accountable, restoring calm, and uh, making campuses safe and welcoming for their full communities, including the Jewish community. So that is text campus to 26769. Um, Francine, what advice do you have? You, your daughter's graduating. I hope that you'll get the commencement she deserves and she has earned. What advice do you have for students and their parents who are getting ready to come to campus for the first time this fall? Uh, yes. Yeah. So if I had a student starting this fall, I would um, suggest to them, because it really has to be student driven, uh, that they contact the Hillel Chabad or other Jewish or pro-Israel uh, organizations on campus. Uh, Hillel and Chabad, I know, maintain a list for incoming freshmen, and that will help them get an initial step into the Jewish organization um, and also visit those organizations that have an open house during orientation or pre-orientation, whatever that's offered. Some university, some uh, campuses also offer pre-orientation that might be geared towards, they might have a subset geared towards the Jewish community. So that would be a good opportunity. And I would also suggest that encouraging your student over the summer to take advantage of different workshops that might be offered by Jewish community organizations. I know that Stand With Us has offered them. I don't know if ADL has that on the radar for this summer. I think it would be a great opportunity to partner with other organizations that are particularly plugged into youth and and do a boot camp. Give them tools so that they know what they're doing when they go on campus and they have these tough conversations, how to navigate them. Um, and then also, if your student might have the opportunity to participate in a summer immersive program, I realize it's late to get started on that, um, but that would be the key. And I also, if I can take a moment, if you 
I'm sure we have parents of middle schoolers and high school schoolers on here. And so to think long term and encourage your child to take advantage of all the opportunities the Jewish community has to offer both locally and nationally uh, so that they really understand, but by the time they get to college, their own identity and can be firm, like Barry expresses so eloquently, um, she gives me hope. And the, it's so important to give your child the tools so that they can do that. And they and not that every child will choose to do that, but so that they can choose to do it if they would like. And it should not come to a surprise when they get to college that there are two narratives, that there are two groups of people that lay claim to this land. Uh, I think Jonathan even mentioned this during his during his remarks. They need to be exposed to both narratives from the start. And there are so many great reading materials on this. One of my favorite is uh, Yossi Klein Halevi's letter to my Palestinian neighbor, a very balanced approach. You can have compassion for two different people and explaining that to your child that it is not binary is so important because otherwise they get to school and they feel like they have to make this choice. Either I stand with them or I stand with them. There's no, there's no middle ground. So I think those are all important things. Thanks, Francine. And Barry, what about you? First of all, I'll say that a bunch of people, Francine kind of jumped to the last question was what gives me hope. And uh, a lot of people agree with Francine that that you are um, a source of hope and your colleagues, um, both at UT and across the country who are leading in this moment. But what's your advice to incoming students and uh, what gives you hope? To any incoming students, it, I would just say, reach out to whoever you know, even if it's a distant friend, if it's a friend of a friend, like you never know who is going to be your next friend, your next ally, Who, even if it's someone you don't know, you see them in class, you see them posting, like it's so important just to reach out and you never know, like who can be an ally or who you can talk to about this. Um, also, I think Halal and Chabad, Olami are all great resources and they're such good, um, great foundations to have. You may not want to go to every service, every Friday night dinner, but you can meet friends through these programs and find your people. And from there, begin other communities. We're very lucky at UT to have a very strong Jewish Greek life system. Um, and for me, that's really been a lot of where I found some of my close friends and where I draw kind of my hope from. I think I see hope on campus, not only when I'm talking with my friends about what's happening on campus or when a group of us heads out to go make our presence on campus known when all these protests are happening, but also when I have people in class being like, hey, and I this was an amazing conversation I had with someone in class. She goes, I keep hearing that what happened, that the protests were anti-Semitic. Can you explain to me why they were anti-Semitic? I don't understand. We had a great 10 minute conversation. She was like, wow, I really see it. Um, and thank you so much for explaining because now I know what to look for. So it's really having these foundational Jewish organizations on campus are great, not just because of what they provide, but also of the foundation that they lay. And from these, I've been able to draw all sorts of friendships and I see hope and how passionate my friends are to be able to have these conversations in my classroom when I may be the only Jewish student. I may be the only student who's gone to Israel. Um, so it's really important to, to just draw hope from each other. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I wanna bring, I, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate your insights, both you, Barry and Francine and, and the constituencies you represent. I Can I just say before we do that call out vote, Barry, like Francine, I give you credit, but Barry, you are an amazing young woman. And we are, I mean, talk about, I don't have hope. Like I have super optimism when I hear you. We are lucky to have you on our team, if you will, in our corner. Mm -hmm. Really, really well done. What, do you, what, what are you doing for the summer? What's the plan? Um, so I'm going to be in Austin all summer. I was able to get an internship through the university, um, and I'll also be working a lot at um, student orientation. So I'll be working a lot. Uh, we have an office there in Austin as well. So if you're yeah. thinking about expanding your internship horizon, please let me know. I would love to. I'm very appreciative. We'll follow up on that offline. Awesome. Great. We'll talk later. Um, Jonathan, I have a couple, couple questions for you. Jonathan, uh, you mentioned the report card, and one of the questions that came in is what the response has been and how we are working with universities uh, to improve uh, their climates and therefore their grades. Look, we wrote 
this, we developed this report card that will be an annual assessment of universities are doing with the intent not of being destructive or critical, but constructive and helpful. Like Congressman Torres said, the goal is to create some reputational pressure since we've seen the schools honestly not willing to do enough on their own. And they might need a bit of an exogenous, you know, like a push from the outside. That's what this is about. So we didn't do this as like an ordered, like a U.S. news list that would go one to a hundred. We don't want to do that. We want everyone to get A's. But in order to get an A, you've got to do certain things or stated differently. There's certain things you cannot or should not allow. And that's what this is about. So we are in conversations. We did a call last week with 80 plus university people from the staff, either university presidents or their staff. Uh, like I alluded to a few minutes ago, I've been visiting a lot of campuses, talking to a lot of campus presidents, um, talking to a lot of chairs, of the boards of trustees, doing whatever we can to be helpful. That is the goal. If you went to Tufts, you go to UT Austin, I want them to get A's. That's what I want. We'll do everything we can to try to help them get there. Um, Francine, I know that you've used some of the resources on the Campus Hub. Can you tell us what else uh, parents need? what they're looking for, what what are the barriers to entry and in, in advocacy in this way, and what can ADL and others provide for you that would be helpful? Um, well, I think what would be a game changer is if the IRA definition could pass through Congress and be codified. I, I believe there's a vote today, is that not correct? I'm not sure. Um, is, there an action, is there an action alert up for ADL? Because I think getting the call out to our Congress people today would be a key Great we, point. Do, uh, we do have uh, an action alert coming later. Yes, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act is being debated in the House uh, today, and that is something that would codify uh, that definition. Great. Um, and we're following up with universities over the summer to get them to do some of the things Jonathan mentioned earlier, modifying their student code so that time, place, and manner are more restricted and therefore the protests won't get so out of hand. It's very, you know, the universities that have been successful at this can be held up as a model. Some of them have no amplification laws. Some of them have rule, uh, not laws, rules. Uh, some of them have rules that they can't be in certain buildings, in, inside certain buildings, or they can't be in the residential areas of universities. So if those that have gotten the high grades on the report card can be held up as a model to the other universities. Perhaps they can make improvements in their time, place, and matter restrictions over the summer. I think that would be incredibly helpful. And and asking the university, making sure that the universities are truly going to um, train their staff as well as their incoming students on anti-Semitism. I know you've already made this ask multiple times, but following up on it over the summer uh, to ask them to implement training, and especially of their DEI staff, but all of their staff should know what anti-Semitism looks like and what it doesn't look like so that they're, they can uh, they can be in a better place next year, next here, academic here. year. Here, here. Barry, what um, same question for you. You're a first year student, you're leading an organization, but some students have come to campus to learn, to study, to, to make new friends, what weren't necessarily expecting to kind of embark on an advocacy career. What's what's the easiest way to get them to join you, to feel empowered, to have what they need to make their voices heard? Yeah, so I think one thing we've really seen a lot here at UT is students don't necessarily want to get out there and be fighting the technicalities of what's what protesters might be saying but what students do really like is celebrating israeli culture i mean you put on some put on some static and ben l you get some bomba and like that's what we found is how we get students to come out so in reframing whatever we're doing um to matt to be pro-israel and not anti pro Palestine. I think that's the easiest way to get students involved. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from Barry Weiss, and she says, Jews were put on the earth to be Jews, not anti anti Semites. And I think when you look at what's happening on campuses from this lens, and we encourage students to join Longhorn Student for Israel, or go to Chabad or go to Hillel or anything. It's not because people don't want your presence. It's because you want your presence. And I think engaging students in this way is how we can keep this momentum and really pull in all sorts of students. 
Thanks, Jonathan. Last question. I know you have to jump. Um, a lot of partners were mentioned on this call. Hillel, Chabad, the Jewish Greek Life Orgs. People are asking if we work with them on this work. And can you talk a little bit about that? About our partnerships, basically? Yes. Look, I think ADL does a very good job of understanding the drivers of coming up with strategies to counter anti-Semitism, but there's no way we can do it alone. And so our whole thrust, and by the way, the same old things don't work anymore. So our whole, I would describe our kind of approach as innovation and partnerships. And I am deeply proud of the work we do with Federation, the work we do with Hillel, Chabad and Campus, AEPI, ZBT, BYO, BBYO, sorry, National Council of Synagogue Youth, which supports young Orthodox uh, teenagers, um, the Jewish Security Alliance, which includes um, CSI and CSS and uh, UJA and other federations. I'm proud of the work that we do with MASA. I'm proud of the work that we do with um, our friends at Jaffe. Like, I believe the only way that we win as a, and by the way, with the reform movement, with the conservative movement, with those in the orthodox movement, the only way that we win is when we as a people come together. When we don't let ideology or politics blind us, we can look beyond our political affiliations because we are a multi-denominational, multi, um, multi-ethnic, multi-racial community. And we need people on all sides, from all walks of life, to lock arms and to push forward together if we want to beat hate. By the way, ultimately, it's not just up to us. Anti-Semitism is just a Jewish problem. It's an American problem. Just like I don't think racism is just a concern for my black friends. I don't think that Asian aid is a concern for my Asian friends. I don't think anti-Semitism is just a concern for the Jewish people. We need to all find ways to work together to recognize the shared humanity in all of us. Again, to have fierce hope for our hostages, bring them home now, even as we have optimism, you know, um, and a kind of compassion for the Palestinian civilians who don't deserve to die. Let's hope together we can end this war. We can bring the hostages home and we can find a better path forward.